if you send somebody a letter in the form of an email, even if that person is on the other side of the planet, it would only take a second before it reaches that person. In the past, we did things very differently. We used birds, homing pigeons, to deliver our letters. How long do you think it would take a bird to deliver that same letter? I did a quick calculation, and if the bird knows exactly where to go to, it doesn't take any rest, it would take him about 10 days, which I would say is pretty impressive. But comparing 10 days to one second, that difference is huge. Communication hasn't been the only industry relying on animals for transportation. The fastest way of getting from A to B was by riding a horse. And also we used animals for the heavy work on the land. But at some point we started inno uh, innovating and we started inventing machines that could replace these animals. Today we all have smartphones full of apps for communication. We invented the car that brings us to our destination in a very fast and comfortable way. And for the, for the work on the land in agriculture, we created magnificent machines that help us with all kinds of tasks. But we didn't stop there. We kept innovating. Now we're not only communicating from person to person on the same planet, we're actually communicating with a robot that's on a different planet. We're not only traveling over land and over water, we're flying through the sky and through space. And even when it comes to something like growing plants, we did not stop innovating. Today we're using smart sensors and robotics to increase the yield, and we're growing large amounts of vegetables inside cities and even deserts. So looking at these three examples, you can see a pretty clear trend. First, we're relying on animals for thousands of years. Then we invent machines that could replace these animals, making the process much faster, much cheaper, and much more reliable. And because we bring technology into the game, we can really start to think big and start creating stuff that were unimaginable before. So if you look at that trend, you would say that all industries out there would probably already have gotten rid of the animals in their industries, right? Unfortunately, this is not the case. About two years ago, my sister asked me to watch this documentary called Cowspiracy. And I was a bit skeptical because I knew it was going to show me the impact of my favorite food. But I still gave it a try. And what it does, it, it shows based on reports by the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, what the impact is of our meat consumption on a global scale. Because we're with a lot of people on this planet and we love to eat meat. And because of that, there are also a lot of farm animals on this planet. By the end of today, we have killed 200 million land animals. Just like we did yesterday, and just like we did the day before yesterday. To grow them, we used a lot of water, not only for them to drink, but also to grow the crops that feed them. And growing all these crops take up a lot of land as well. So actually 30% of all land on Earth is devoted directly or indirectly for the meat industry, and is thereby the leading cause of the, of the deforestation in the Amazon. But on top of all of that, we have this problem with the global warming and climate change. And we're all familiar with carbon dioxide, CO2. But these animals, and especially cows, they're producing a gas called methane, which is a much stronger greenhouse gas. And partly due to that, this industry is responsible for 14.5% of all greenhouse gas emissions, which is actually more than all cars, trains, and uh, airplanes combined. So watching this documentary actually made me pretty upset and quite frustrated of what we're doing to this planet. But also that same day, I decided that I wanted to work on a solution. And I remembered, I remembered uh, this professor, oh, I have to go back. This professor who presented the world the first ever hamburger grown in a laboratory. And I really liked that concept because why would you grow the whole animal if you can actually only grow the part that we're eating? Back then, I was still studying mechanical engineering and I didn't know anything about culturing meat, but uh, I learned mostly about robotics and automation. 
But I read that it took them three months and a small team to create this single hamburger. So I figured they might need some automation there. Uh, I reached out and I'm happy to be part of an incredible team with people from all over the world who all came to the Netherlands and joined Mozameet to create the machine that will replace the animals in the meat industry. So how will such a machine look like? Well, uh, it will be roughly like this. <laughs> and it's a f actually a five-step process where I will quickly guide you through. First of all, you still need an animal uh, from which we take a small sample. And if you zoom into that sample, you actually see functional muscle fiber. And on top of that muscle, there's a, thing, a cell called a satellite cell. Whenever you work out, uh, or you're injured yourself, this cell will go to the place of injury, it will start dividing, and it will fuse together, um, fixing the, the muscle tissue. So what we do, we bring this cell into the right circumstances, body temperature, uh, we're giving them sugars, amino acids, uh, everything that it needs. And you see that after 24 hours, one cell becomes two. 24 hours later, two cells become four. And this sounds really slow, but if you keep doing this, and we're, one of the challenges we have is trying to push this as far as possible, is that, well, if you have one kilogram of these cells, you only have to wait 24 hours to create two kilograms of cells. Once we have those, the third step is to bring them into, uh, to, to kind of stimulate them to align, and they will fuse together. And this will already give the structure that we're expecting from meat. After that step, we still keep it in the machine and we kind of train it or we, we leave it like that so they can actually mature into real muscle fibers, uh, giving the protein density that we're expecting from our meat. So once we have enough of them, we bring them together and we form a hamburger. Like that. But of course, we're not going to st stop there. Uh, we also want to create meat from other animals, but also we want to create st a steak, for example. So we're definitely going to work on that as well. So, but the question is, once we have these machines ready, how does the farmer know that it's time for the next generation? That it's time to start investing in these machines instead of breeding more of these animals into existence? Because in the end, this farmer also decided to buy a tractor instead of buying a horse, right? So how do you compare a machine to an animal? And something very similar happened about 200 years ago when the first engines were introduced. Back then also the unit horsepower was introduced. And the question is now, so what is the horsepower of cultured meat? And when it comes to cultured meat, it's more about production, right? So how fast can you produce meat? How, do, how fast does a cow produce meat? First of all, Let's start with a single cell again. Normally, it would take nine and a half months until birth. And in normal circumstances, a cow will live up to over 20 years of age. However, it's born in an industry that's mostly uh, focused on efficiency. So if you're born in the dairy industry, you'll probably uh, be slaughtered at the age of seven years. But if you're born in the meat industry, you usually don't make it up until your second birthday. So we're talking about 700 days, 780 days on average. Please keep this uh, number in mind. Then you grow this big animal, right? over then it's become 630 kilograms. But not everything is edible. So you have 40% blood, intestines, brain, skin. And from the carcass still you need to take the bones out. So you're left with approximately half of what you started with, 315 kilograms. So one cow would produce 315 kilograms in 780 days, which on average would be 400 grams per day. So if you can create a machine that can grow 400 grams of meat per day, you're actually replacing one animal. So how are we going to call this unit? How are we going to call the horsepower of cultured meat? If you have a, a better uh, idea, please come to me after my talk. But uh, we did some brainstorming with, uh, with the students in the lab, and we came up with capacity. <laughs> the capacity of one cow when it comes to producing meat. 
So one capacity, how would that look like? What, how big would this machine be? Or with the current technology that we're using now, if we would scale it up to that size, it would be one meter wide, two meter high, and about two and a half meter long. Which I would say is actually pretty reasonable, because if you would put a, a cow into a tight cage, it would ha this cage would have these kind of dimensions. But we're talking about technology, and we all know that if you put enough effort in it, if enough engineers will, will, will be working on this, uh, the, the machine will become more efficient, and over time it will shrink. So pro probably in a couple of years I will look back at this presentation, and I'll be laughing at what I'm showing you right now. Still, there's a lot of work that needs to be done, not only on the technical side, but also on um, regulations. And before we have implemented this all over the world, and we're seeing the impact that we're looking for, it's going to take years. And in those years, all these environmental issues are only stacking up. Luckily, we as consumers can already start making a difference. A year ago, I decided to challenge myself and do this experiment where for two months straight I didn't eat any meat. And I was actually quite surprised about how many delicious alternatives that are already out there. Also during the time I finally had the courage to open my eyes and see what we're actually doing to, some, to these animals in some of these factory farms and slaughterhouses. Realizing that we're causing so much harm made it even easier to stick to such a diet. If you're considering eating less meat or even trying such an experiment yourself, I would really encourage you to do so. Still, I would love to be able to taste, to enjoy the taste of meat again without all the consequences. And I think most of us would. So we need to keep developing this, te this technology. And I want to conclude with this. Even if we did something for a very long time, that doesn't necessarily mean it was the most optimum or even a good way of doing it. We need to keep developing and embracing alternatives like plant-based foods and meat machines. Because only then we can create a future where we have a sustainable ecosystem, where people are healthy and not suffering from hunger, and where we treat all animals with respect. Thank you. Hmm.